So grab your Bibles out if you want. Uh, we're going to be reading from Genesis uh, chapter 1. Okay, Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. God saw that the light was good, and he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, the first day. And God said, Let there be a vault between the waters to separate water from water. So God made the vault and separated the water under the vault from the water above it. And it was so. God called the vault sky, and there was evening, and there was morning the second day. And God said, Let the water under the sky be gathered to one place, and let dry ground appear. And it was so. God called the dry ground land, and gathered waters he called seas. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, Let the land produce vegetation, seed bearing plants and trees on the land that bear fruit with seed in it, according to their various kinds. And it was so. The land produced vegetation, plants bearing seeds according to their kinds, and trees bearing fruit with seed in it according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning the third day. And God said, let there be lights in the vault of the sky to separate the day from the night and let them serve as signs to mark sacred times and days and years and let them be lights in the vault of the sky to give light on the earth. And it was so. God made two great lights, the greater light to govern the day and the lesser light to govern the night. He also made the stars. God set them in the vault of the sky to give light on the earth, to govern the day and the night, and, it was to, and to separate light from darkness. And God saw it was good. There was evening and there was morning, the fourth day. And God said, let the water teem with living creatures and let birds fly above the earth across the vault of the sky. So God created the great creatures of the sea and every living thing with which the water teems and that moves about in it according to their kinds and every winged bird according to its kinds. And God saw that it was good. God blessed them and said, be fruitful and increase in number and fill the water in the, in the seas and let the birds increase on the earth. <coughs> And there was evening and there was morning, the fifth day. And God said, let the land produce living creatures according to their kinds, the livestock, the creatures that move along the ground, and the wild animals, each according to its kind. And it was so. God made the wild animals according to their kinds, the livestock according to their kinds, and all the creatures that move along the ground according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Then God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. They will be yours for food. And to all the beasts of the earth <coughs> and all the birds in the sky and all the creatures that move along the ground, Everything that has the breath of life in it, I will I give every green plant for food. 
and it was so. God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were completed in their vast array. By the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. Then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it he rested from all the work he had done of creating. Hello, I'm Christy, and I'm going to continue reading the Bible for us tonight, starting at Genesis chapter 2, verse 4. This is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created, when the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. Now, no shrub had yet appeared on the earth, and no plant had yet sprung up. For the Lord God had not sent rain on the earth, and there was no one to work the ground. But streams came up from the earth and watered the whole surface of the ground. Then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. Now the Lord God had planted a garden in the east, in Eden, and there he put the man he had formed. The Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. In the middle of the garden were the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. A river watering the garden flowed from Eden. From there, it was separated into four headwaters. The name of the first is the Pishon. It winds through the entire land of Havilah, where there is gold. The gold of that land is good. Aromatic resin and onyx are also there. The name of the second river is the Gihon. It winds through the entire land of Cush. The name of the third river is the Tigris. It runs along the east side of Asher. And the fourth river is the Euphrates. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat from it, you will certainly die. The Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Now, the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the wild animals and all the birds in the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever that man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds in the sky, and all the wild animals. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and then closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. The man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. Adam and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. Thanks, Christy, for reading again one of the best passages you'll ever read or hear read. And uh, for the first chapter of Genesis being read to us. Yeah. So welcome tonight. Hope it's a little bit warmer in here than out there. It's got a, yeah, a bit chilly lately. So my name's Martin, if you haven't met. And we're, as you've probably heard, we're in a new series where we're starting to look at uh, the realities of being made as men and women. And first two weeks, like today and next week, we're looking in Genesis 1 to 3. Uh, the next three weeks, we're going to talk about things we don't normally talk about. And we often talk about marriage. Uh, we just had a seminar on marriage and had a number of sermons in the last year on marriage. So we're going to talk about singleness. The following two weeks, we're going to talk about the challenges of same-sex attraction and transgenderism a little bit. The next week we're going to talk about uh, the ways in which God wants to change unwanted sexual behaviour in our lives. Um, and then for the rest of the term, the last part of the term, we're going to talk often in New Testament passages um, to reflect on what the Bible is going to say about relating as men and women in, in church and family life. That's our aim. And I want to ask you up front um, to to actually be gracious to us as speakers and pray for us. And also, um, 
I want to encourage some conversations. Our marriage seminar was so good, 60 or 80 people getting together every week, started discussing the things they have to go through in marriage, in relationships, the challenges. And, and, and that is actually one of our big goals. Same here. I want to encourage you to discuss things. And, and in particular, if you feel okay to, you, you may have a problem or disagree with some things we may say through the series. You also may have questions. Uh, we'll, later in the series, we'll have Q&A and opportunity to all those things will get to come up. But, but we are aware, James and I are very aware that, that this is a series that is sort of charged in different ways. It affects actually all of us differently. And we're concerned that we may say things that are heard wrong or may be hurtful. And so our, our intent is not to do that unnecessarily ever. And so we're really concerned that you, you, there's a sense of we can talk about that. Um, our aim is to speak from the scriptures, but also to, to try to speak with wisdom and carefully about the topic, about the realities of this. And so we're trying to do it from a place of humility. Uh, it's very important. I'm going to pray and ask God to help us do that. Uh, Father God, thank you for your word and the way um, you guide us in life, the way you actually bring us hope in the midst of whatever we're in the middle of. So we thank you for Jesus and his resurrection. Now that guides the possibilities of life with you. In Jesus' name, amen. So I just have a couple of comments, two comments to make before I say anything about a passage in Genesis and start to dig in. Uh, and this is because there's a lot of confusing things often said, a lot of aggressive things in our culture, even in church settings, about men and women, what it means to be a man and woman, how we should relate in marriage and family. And so two things. The first thing is there can often be a confusion when you make general statements about men and women. And, it, and it's important to be able to distinguish if a general statement, what, what it means. If I said men are taller than women, there's a sense in which that is true and there's a sense in which it's not true. You might know that on average, men are 13 centimetres taller than women. So that might be generally true, but it is not absolutely true, is it? Because I know plenty of women that are taller than plenty of men. But see, if we're going to talk about what the Bible has to say about men and women over this term, we've got to be able to make general statements at times. And I want you to be aware that we're going to be trying to clarify when we're trying to be general or absolute. Because some things are not true in an absolute sense when they are true in a general sense. That's the first thing. And there's, there's many. The other one is, is probably the, the most important because when we talk about what it means to be a man or a woman, usually there's a tone to the whole thing. Um, can you put up your hand if you've ever been to a, a men's conference? Been to plenty. What about a ladies' conference? You have been to them? I haven't, but I know plenty of you have. Um, so often when things are said at those spaces, it's through the terms of ought rather than is. That if you want to be a man, look, I've, I've heard this. If you want to be a real man, you need to change your oil, get a tattoo, mow the lawn, hunt, shoot and eat meat, don't eat decaf, yell at people, grow a beard <laughs> um, and, and, and roar like a lion. That's what it means to be a real man, right? So... Um, that's down, and, and so, uh, by the way, it's worse for women and, and what is required of a woman, at, usually at a woman's conference, to be a real woman, I think, is, is problematic when it's through the tone of ought. But the Bible is going to put an is over my life and it just says it in the terms of is, not ought, which is very different. Um, a writer many years ago, a uh, very interesting guy, wrote a book called Like Blue Jazz, and, and he, he uh, on a stage, said, this is what you need to be a man. You need a penis that makes you a man. And, and there's a very simple isness to the way the Bible talks about maleness and femaleness rather than an ought. So it's very important that you understand we don't want to have a tone of ought here. And I want to say, you know, and by the way, the things that God would have us do has got nothing to do with the car you drive and the coffee you drink. All right? So we want to pause in that. But here's our thing, the book of Genesis. There's a, a picture up there of a, a well-known book years ago called uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Has anyone read this book? 
that there's this computer in there called Deep Thought and it's asked, can it answer the ultimate question of life in the universe? And it goes away for a long time and it comes back with its answer and says, the answer is 42. <laughs> Someone's read it. This is often what it feels like when you go to the Bible with your pressing questions about an issue like men and women, 42. What's the question, let alone the answer? It sort of doesn't, doesn't work, does it? And so often you and I have got questions and it, it so often is frustrating when we go to the Bible because our questions usually end up distorting anything the Bible's got to say when we start with them. So what I want to encourage you to do, if you're going to stay with us through this series, is to keep your questions. Remember, we're going to have a chance to answer any questions that aren't addressed in any of our talks, but, but shelve them as you begin to listen to the Bible. This talk won't be, I won't be as fast as normal. I'm going to slow down on purpose. I'm going to speak slower than normal. I, I'm not going to make a million points. I'm just going to let us listen to the rhythm of Genesis 1 and 2 a little bit. And hopefully you're going to let it affect you and become more curious and inquisitive about what the Bible's got to say, the way it's shaped, the pattern and the rhythm of it. Because it's not like us. See, just stop and think. Look around the room. Everything pretty much around us has been mass produced. The chair you're sitting on was mass produced. I don't know who made it. I don't even know what company. How many thousands have been made? It affects the way we think about everything. We live in a departicularized world of interchangeable parts. Every organization just has a gap to be filled with another interchangeable person. We deal with concepts with the Bible like everyone is just interchangeable parts. But the Bible does, is not written like that. It's a story of particularity. It talks about things like blood, sweat, menstruation, chewing the cud, hair, bodily emissions, rivers and mountains, trees, cypress, cedar trees, vines. What's it like to be a man, a woman, a queen, a king, to be the firstborn or later born, to live in a particular season of life? This is how the Bible talks. And so it's an odd book for us because of the world we live in shapes where we often go to the Bible. So we're not opening Gender Systems Chapter 1. <laughs> it's Genesis Chapter 1. And, and so what this says about the creation of the universe and men and women, has a, it's a literary context. It has a particular rhythm, a particular pattern to it. And the pattern is part of the message. So I want to highlight just the first couple of verses first. Let's look at the first two verses you heard read this, this evening. In the beginning, the most well-known ten words in the Bible. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And just two words I want you to notice. It was formless and empty. You're going to notice, if we're going to pay attention to the text... And actually, things relating to what it means to be a male, what it means to be a female, you're going to notice some, some pairs have been highlighted and distinguished to be brought together to bring life in the creation story. And there's two statements that set up the way this rhythm works. The writer observes in a very wonderful way that, that everything was formless and it was void. The Hebrew words tohu abohu. You want to say it with me? Tohu abohu. You know, some Hebrew. Cool. Tohu, formless. Bohu, empty. And, and the first three days map onto the second three days. The first three days respond to tohu. It's formless. The second three respond to void. It's empty. And so you'll see in the first three days, God is creating form. In the second three days, he's filling it with life and they all correspond. But each time he does it, he gives us this beautiful distinguished pair that is then brought together to create form and life. Let's have a look. Day one. It's fantastic. There's so much here. Oh boy, how much have I missed out? <laughs> oh boy. You're lucky, aren't you? <laughs> Four pages we missed out. <laughs> so... Verse of day one, let there be light, and it's distinguishing between day and night. So there's form created. 
That, that maps onto day four, where, where, where the heavens are filled with lights. Sun, moon and stars, to distinguish day and night. So that form was then filled to rule that space for the sake of day and night. The second day, God separates the waters above from the waters below. On the fifth day, that is filled. Birds in the sky, fish in the sea, teeming with life. Day three, there's two creative acts, the establishment of land and vegetation. And on day six, God creates animals and then human beings. Now, we, we, we might go, okay, let's talk about men and women now. I want to ask my questions. But we don't even know what this means. See, when we see let there be light, we think, oh, it's all about light in the dark heavenlies. But actually, what's the purpose of light being made? It's to separate day from night. The purpose of light was all about day and night, which is a temporal reality. It's about time. God is beginning the first beat. He's starting a rhythm. This is the beat of time. You know, there's seven days, and, and Hebrew poetry is written as a poem, especially to be memorized. It, it, it like has a dimension to it. So the middle day helps you understand the meaning of the lot. Day four, what was happening? Day four, we've got the stars in the heavens. We've got sun, moon, and stars to help rule the reality of time. This is telling us, this is actually starting to talk about time a lot more, isn't it? Days, months, years. And you think of their life of festivals, of a week, of days of work and days of rest. And then God rests on the seventh day, another pair, ordinary days and sacred days. And, and you'll notice the filling, God is filling with vegetation that has the capacity to propagate itself. That, that animals and humans can, can recreate in their own image. And I want you to notice something huge, huge up front. We are late to the party. We turn up near the end. All this stuff is in motion and then we show up. And so when you begin asking your particular issues, your questions that you care about what it means to be male, what it means to be female, what it means to be a mum or a dad or a widow or an orphan, or a brother or a sister, whatever your season, stage, place in life, whatever your questions are, it's so easy to make this whole thing about us. But we're at the end. This is actually about God and his, and his goodness, his creation. So whatever we are to do, it's focused outward on the creation. Psalm 104. Read it this week if you're interested. All the things God's created. He says, check out my little lapdog, Leviathan. Just be amazed at my creative power. Let that affect you. And we're told in our job of being responsible for God's creation, because that's the setting. God creates everything and puts us there to rule and subdue, to actually fill and multiply, to care for God's creation. We're told that animals are our helpers. And so, you know, animals help you find water, help you find food, might help you grow more crops. It's amazing what God has given to us. Amazing. So I hope you notice there's a fit to the way the cosmos has been put together. There's these distinguished pairs that are brought together to bring life. They're not separated to stay separate. So we've got heaven and earth, day and night, sun and moon. There's one sun and one moon. Significant. It's not like a bunch of moons like Jupiter. There's male and female. So stop and think about what this might mean. See, this is very important. So if you just have earth above and earth below, you don't have life. You've got a cave. If you've just got heaven above and heaven below, you don't have life. It's a little bit like Jupiter. You've got space above and gas below. But so what God is doing is bringing together the heavens and the earth to actually create fruitfulness, to create life. Different coming together to bring life. God separates the woman from the man and then they're brought together to be one flesh, to literally bring life. 
And you'll notice the very first pair we jumped over. In the beginning, God created, do you know it off by heart? The what? The what? Are we a cult? Like, just speak normal. It's like you're like, I'm doing real. Uh, God created the what? The, and the earth, right. The first pair. You know the story that, that we walked away from God and there was a separation between heaven and earth. That's the whole story of this whole thing. Eventually, the Prince of Heaven comes down to earth to establish his kingdom, and then we have the coming together at the end of the book of heaven and earth. Everything's made glorious. And so all those things are fully brought together. You no longer have day and night and sun and moon because it's all made glorious. And what God has brought together, let no one separate. That's the tone of Genesis. God is bringing together. So he separated light from dark, day from night, waters above from below, sea from land, sun from moon, fish from birds, animals, humans, work from rest, Cain from Abel, Abraham from other nations, holy days from common days. God makes distinctions in creation. The Jewish have Dala prayer at the end of Sabbath. Just thanks God for all those things I just mentioned in that list. This says so much about us. So I have another word I want you to say that's not Hebrew. It's just an English word. It's the word, it's an unusual word, complementarity. Can you try and say that? Complementarity. Right. Sorry. I feel like school. Sorry about that. I was going to say tonight is a little, a little bit uh, on the heavy side of information. It's a little bit more theological, unashamedly, to help get some bearings before we head into our series. I think it's some of the rhythms of the Bible. Dictionary says complementarity is a relationship or situation in which two or more different things improve or emphasize the other's qualities. Example, a culture composed of complementarity of men and women. That's just in the dictionary. The word is complementarity. I want you to notice it's not the word complementarianism. If anyone's done any reading on this sort of topic in the Christian world, there's a school of thought, actually various versions of a school of thought about how men and women um, relate in the world and church and so on, called complementarianism. That's not what I mean. There's also another school of thought called egalitarianism, and there's various versions of that too. But that's not what we mean here either. This is like the big tent that I think every Christian believes. That this is like biblical understanding of maleness and females starts with the idea all the way through the creation account of complementarity. People may disagree on how that might look in a church or in a family and so on between the sexes. But the idea of complementarity is just that, that there are two distinguished different things, relationship or situations that improve or emphasize the qualities of the other. That's what's happening in creation. This is huge for the outcome, for, the, for what it means. I think the implications as human beings, huge for us. So, so here's some things that we actually don't, that I don't think the Bible's saying about what it means to be a man and a woman from what we just said. And, and, and here's one emphasis in our culture and then I'll show you another emphasis. One emphasis in our culture is the idea that everything is interchangeable, that men and women are just the same. That there, there, there's actually no distinguishing differences. Now, that's not as common now, but there's a reality in our understanding of sexuality that, that, is a, that there's a lot less distinguishability going on in our culture. This idea that everything can be the same. This is not the same as talking about the best person can do the job, whether they're a woman or a man. I think that's a great principle in a company. But, but what actually what we're talking about is the idea of sameness. And that's not grounded in creation here. Complementarity is different, isn't it? The, it's the idea. I want, my way of saying it is beautiful difference. That's what we see all over Genesis 1 and 2. Beautiful difference brought together to bring life. That's different to everything being the same. And, and maybe a, a fairly funny way to see that is in... Um, in the difference between a Gnostic writing and Jesus in the Gospels. I'm going to put up here, a, a, the next thing is a, a writing from, it, it's a few hundred years after Jesus in the Gospels, and it's, and, and it's so different from what we'll see what Jesus is like. This is not in the Bible, it, it, it's not a biblical book at all. 
When you make the two, it's suggesting Jesus said this though. When you make the two into one and when you make the inside like the outside and the outside like the inside and the above like the, the below, that is to make the male and the female into a single one so that the male will not be male and the female will not be female. And when you make eyes instead of an eye and a hand instead of a hand and a foot instead of a foot and an image instead of an image, then you'll enter the kingdom. Okay. I don't know if you're any of the wiser from reading that, but it's definitely, it's a Gnostic vision of life suggesting Jesus was saying this. It, it, this is, is not um, an eyewitness account of Jesus' life at all. Flip to the next slide, you've got Jesus in the Gospels. Some Pharisees came to him to test him. They asked, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason? Haven't you read, he replied, that at the beginning the Creator made them male and female. He said, for this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife. And the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined let, together, let no one separate. You see, there's a huge difference there, isn't there, between Jesus and actually the Gnostic vision. So the idea of everything, everyone's the same and completely inter interchangeable, that whatever I can do, a woman can do, whatever a woman can do, I can do, I don't think that is, that is a biblical idea. There are plenty of things that we can all do, but there's also plenty that we can't all do. And, and there's, there's something un foundational here. And I want you to notice, we should see the connection when our culture, our society, has no longer a distinction between heaven and earth, when it's just earth. You'll find there's also less of a distinction between men and women and the thinking in our culture. And I think there is a sense where, at least in terms of creation, a sexless society is... is more of a godless society. There's difference that is a beautiful difference that enhances our come together. So that, that's one thing that I don't think is a Christian vision. The other one that's not a Christian vision of, of men and women is, is one of total otherness. Um, uh, I've just been so encouraged by reading um, uh, a feminist, her name is, she described, uh, Camille Paglia describes herself as a, uh, an Amazon feminist. She, she's She's a person to behold. She's one of the most intelligent provocators I've ever read. Her book is incredible. And, and she, uh, she, she, she majors on looking at art through history and sociology and, and obviously feminism is a passion for us. The next, next picture is a comparison between two, two things of antiquity. We have Venus of Willendorf on the left and we have a head bust of the Egyptian Nefiti. On, oh, sorry, Nefertiti. And how different are those images, right? Now, now th this bust on the left this is actually something you can hold in your hand. You'll notice the feet are cut off. That's, that's intentional because the, the people actually wanted this woman to not be running around. They, they would actually supply... Her, her, her shape is a sign of abundance and wealth that she can keep doing what she can in giving birth to life. And, and so he, here's the thing that, that Camille Paglia will tell us that... that that what you're seeing here is a contrast between East and West. On this side, it's the East. On this side, it's the West. Female, actually, and male. This is a female bus, but it's a male vision of life. We've got curves and lines, cyclical, linear, chaos, order, body and head. She literally says what you have here is a pagan and a Judeo-Christian uh, vision. And in the end... The Jaya Christian one won. She says, actually, although there's many problems as a feminist, that it was good for women that it won. But what she's saying here is what you had was the victory of a sky cult over an earth cult. Um, head magic over belly magic. In the end, male over female, lines over circles. You can see the hard lines of the Egyptian bust and the angles. So different, isn't it? And it's a picture of two women. Now, now the thing is, her distinctions actually they make a lot of sense, don't they? Some of those differences even sound Christian. They're definitely a lot of them are right. You know, you know, she'll, she'll compare, say, um, and like the scriptures do, the womb of a woman to the earth, rain the sexual organs of a man because fertilizing externally a woman's 
fertilizing capacity is internal. Her creative work is internal. That's the belly. Males, males um, like sexual organs are out external, linear, climactic. Women's are internal, cyclical. So different. We're not the same. But here's the difference. It, while those things are true in a certain sense, and they might sound Christian in a lot of ways because there's good differences there, her vision of sexuality, like her vision of the cosmos, is not one of complementarity. It's one of conflict. Everything she writes about men and women is termed in terms of, of competition, of rivalry, of violence, of conflict. There's no peace in that vision. And so a Christian vision of whatever it is to begin with is a different one to everything's the same and everything's other. But everything's different, beautiful difference that can come together. That's a different vision. There's a little slide. It's, it's got someone's musings on this. You can see sort of a general <laughs> of the distinction. The Christian idea of men and women is not so other that we're always in conflict, not so same that we're completely interchangeable. It's like the middle. It's a whole different vision. So you can flip the slide. Now what I want you to do is just pause and reflect on something. Here's the reality. We've just said some things that are massive about this text. And what I'm trying not to do is give you seven to ten uh, other contrasts in this that help you see some difference between men and women. I really, I was saying to James before, I so want to do that, but I'm, I'm resisting it because what I'm trying to get you to do is let the Bible make you inquisitive. Pay attention to what it's doing the way it's written. You know what? We're just reading three chapters of Genesis in this series, but we're so limited in what we're doing. If we really cared about the issue, we would talk about Genesis in the context of the first five books of the Bible, which is how it was presented. And there's so much in the building of the tabernacle, in, in, in things that help understand Genesis, the language is decisively connected and it helps us understand again what it means to be a man and a woman to some degree, but we're not even, we haven't got time to even touch that. So we've just got to recognize this is a massive issue in the Bible. So you need to be inquisitive. But the second thing is it all, we are all so affected by our lives when we come to read about this. This is a very hot issue for me personally. Growing up in a family where I had a dad who mistreated all of us and especially the women in the home. And so I came out of that really struggling with what it meant to be a man and in particular how men and women are meant to relate. And, for, and really for the rest of my whole life, but especially for the next four, three to five years, I literally bought every book that was written by people about this issue, as much as I could afford. I went to Bible college people, lecturers, and I, I, it began a journey for me. But what I'm going to tell you, I've changed my thinking a, a number of times, and, but here's the big thing. I'm just going to be really honest. I, I, I come to the Bible with prejudices. I have biases to the Bible directly connected to my life experiences. If you don't acknowledge that, you're quite foolish, especially on something so important. And so I was profoundly affected when I first started reading about this at 18 to 20. And, and I'm affected now, and like you, and especially unaddressed areas of difficulty in my life. That just happens without me even being aware of it. So I have a question I want you to discuss, if you're okay to discuss with the people around you. Sorry if, 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 if that's hard to do. Discuss with yourself. That's all right. <laughs> but I want to encourage you to talk for 30 seconds a minute. I have a question. It's just a question to throw out there, see where it lands. It doesn't matter. Do you agree or disagree? Gender is a social construct. Gender is a social construct. Just have for a sec. Do you agree or disagree?
Okay, have we got any thoughts on this? Uh, actually, I'm just going to ask you now. I'm sorry to stop the conversation. Feel free to pick them up later. The question is, gender um, a social construct? Uh, anyone agree? Okay. Anyone disagree? Anyone think the question's flawed? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Maybe a lot of you. <laughs> is that right? Right, I just want you to think about it. In part, I want you to think about it because that is a phrase that you hear in our culture at large quite often. And so it's important to engage with it no matter what you think of the, the problem with the statement itself. But I'm going to tell you, my experience of my own gender has been affected by my life experiences, by my society. It's affected it. And I'm using the terms my, my biology, my sex, if you like, my biology or sex, as opposed to gender is my experience of that. Right? So I'm born as a male, and, I'm, and, our, and our society was a common way at the moment, one way is to talk about gender in terms of my experience of my biological sex. Is it a social construct? Whatever you think about that statement, whatever you think about um, the idea or the problems with that, you've been affected by the world you live in, by the family you grew up in, and by your biology. It has huge effects on us. So one thing I want to say, we all know we're not neutral in this. And the scriptures say God has gifted everyone with sexuality. Everyone. It's described as a gift. All of this creation is a gift. It's not just given, sexuality is not just given to men and women. All of us. Here's one of the hard things which we'll talk about as we go through our series, but we do not talk about that in church normally. At our marriage seminar, I asked people to put up their hands who had a conversation with their parents about sex when they're growing up. And out of 60 to 80 people, three put their hands up. So that's a good example of the reality that we just don't have language to talk about sex, about our sexuality, about my experience of that. We've got a millennia of language put together in the history of the church to talk about Jesus being fully God, fully man, about the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, about the uh, doctrines of the church, doctrines of salvation, doctrines of, of how we change because of the Holy Spirit in our life. We've got so much, but hardly anything. We're very much neo, neo-platonic in, in the way we just don't talk about that. So it's awkward, right? I start talking about something like that and it's weird. Maybe it's a, ooh, we're doing it for a term. So I want you to begin to get used to talking about things that you're not that used to talking about. But here's something huge that's, that's an assumption here from Genesis 1 and 2. God designed everything in me, even that. And all of it is connected to his purpose in my life somehow. Somehow my design equips me for why I'm here. Um, the next image is, is a picture of a, a home built in uh, Southwest Pennsylvania in the States by Frank Lloyd Wright, a very rich uh, department store magnate, asked Frank Lloyd Wright to build a house. I noticed this house is called Falling Water. It's literally built into a mountain. You notice there's a waterfall flowing through the home. He restricted himself into to just a couple of building materials and all earthy colours. He wanted this to be an escape from the city. Getting back to your organic origins. And so I want to ask you to think about what does it mean for you that you're made the way you are? How have you experienced you? If I haven't met you before and we say hello later, what I'm really asking you is, look, I'm meeting you at chapter 7. I'd love to know what it's like the first six chapters have been. That's really the essence of what I'm asking us to think about for ourselves. How do we experience our design? This is very important. There's a word here in verse 26 and 27 of chapter 1 that describes human beings that is essential to talking about what it means to be whoever we are. Verse 26, Then God said, Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish, in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and over all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. 
So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. The image of God is a statement here. What does it mean to be made in the image of God? It's a good question. How do you define that? How do you put your finger on, I've got the image of God in me, but my pet dog doesn't. It's made by God, it glorifies God, but uh, it doesn't have God's image. So how do I tell the difference? Well, we've had a few ways over history. One way people said uh, was reason, intellect. That sets me apart from my dog. Okay, that could be a way. There was a season in, in church history where it was all about our functionality as ruling and subduing, filling and multiplying. There's other seasons recently where it's more relational, how relational I am. It has a social vision for what it means to be made in the image of God. What's it mean? We well, have to go back to what that language meant to the original people. And it was connected to the idea of representing a sovereign, being the representative of a ruler. So in Christ's own time, Caesar ruled. And, and he had such a big rule that there were some people in other areas that were his vice regents. And so you've heard from the Bible, the character Pilate, he was ruling as a representative of Caesar in Jerusalem. So this is the idea of being in the image of God. We sort of got to make that connection. You see it with statues, you see it with coinage. In the gospels, some people came and asked Jesus about paying taxes and he said, get me a coin. And then he said, look at the image stamped on the coin to telling us who has authority, who owns this. And he said, give what Caesar's to him, but render what is God's under God. And it's a play on the idea that we bear God's image and so we render ourselves to God. This is this, the idea of the image of God. I want you to, to just put this in your, start ticking over the idea of being in the image of God is connected to the idea of a vocation. Vocal, the word vocal voice comes from vocation because my life has been spoken into existence, the meaning and purpose. What I'm all about, it was given from my Father in heaven. Paul in, in Acts 17 describes us all being created as children of God, given the breath of life. He picks language from the creation account. I want you to notice the way Genesis 5, oh, yeah, 5 verses 1 to 3 describe God's work and Adam's work and how it helps us understand, I think, the first way, a primal way to understand being made in God's image. The first thing is we represent God here. I want you to notice this. Genesis 5 verse 1, this is the written account of Adam's family line. When God created mankind, he made them in, his, in the likeness of God. He created them male and female and blessed them. And he named them mankind when they were created. When Adam had lived 130 years, he had a son in his own likeness, in his own image, and he named him Seth. So Adam's sort of imitating what God did, right? He's creating a child in his own likeness called Seth. When you get to the Gospel of Luke, you have the family tree of Jesus backwards. And it goes backwards. Then you have Seth, the son of Adam, and then it says, who's the son of God. And that's the first way to relate as male and female. We have a kinship because we were brought into existence from a heavenly father. That's the first way to relate as male and female it's a primal understanding of the image of God. The image of God is usually used in modern days to equate equality. Oh, you all have the image of God, so you're all equal. But you see, the text is doing something different. It's moving us somewhere different in terms of our purpose, why we're created. And just stop and think for a moment of our picture of our house and your design, whoever you are, how it affects what God intended for you. Just pause and reflect on this. Um, I want to tell you just a quick story about Lachlan, one of my kids. He's not here, so it's easier. So um, it's 23, so 23 years ago, this time of year, Martine was pregnant, my wife. She got very sick in the pregnancy, couldn't wait for the thing to 
get done by the time it was and got quite sick in many ways afterwards but she goes through all this effort and then her boy pops out and he looks nothing like her <laughs> you would think it might sort of <laughs> poor fella looks like me and the reality is it's often you know the, so when they're filling out paperwork in the hospital the thing is though they don't ask who the mother is they ask who the father is And a good father comes and says, that's my child. I'm taking responsibility for that child. This helps you understand something about the nature of motherhood, which a man can't do, and fatherhood. You know, a man can create and leave. But he has to come back and say, no, that's my child. I'm responsible for it. And so, so the phenomena we have of, of, of people saying, I didn't know my dad. There's so many reasons for that, but one of them is related to our biology, isn't it? The nature of fatherhood. So when Jesus is baptized, God speaks from heaven, he's mine. I'm taking responsibility for him. At Genesis, all over it. You know, you actually, Adam's created out of the ground. The imagery of out of the womb from basically the, the image of Mother Earth. Genesis 1 is God saying, that's mine. I'm taking responsibility here. So what I'm saying is fatherhood is connected to the way fathers are men are designed. So is motherhood. It's not everything about what it means to be a father or a mother. It's not everything about what it means to be a male or female. Because, but, but can you see there's something essential going on there, isn't it? There's something about how design plays in. Now, now when we talk about, and I'm going to finish with this section here now, distinctions between men and women, usually the way we, we, we talk about it, I think it's often problematic for women because usually women get what's left over that men don't do. And even if we don't mean that, that's how we set it up. And even if those things are all true, I think it's hard to hear it right. And so I had seven to ten things to talk about between men and women, but I'm concerned about how we hear and how we actually let the Bible have its own rhythm for us. So notice the four things that are clear how Eve is presented. She's presented firstly as a ruler with Adam. They both created equal before, co-heirs of grace are called to rule and subdue, to create life, fill and multiply. Um, the fact is, just because you have children doesn't mean a family is, is actually filling and multiplying the way God intended. So a couple doesn't have to have a baby to create. That's what I'm saying. Even though that is central in the story, isn't it, in the realities. The idea of ruling and subduing is the idea of walking through naked territory or leaving a footprint. So the questions are, what do you create? What has come into existence because you're here? If you're married, as the picture of Adam and Eve... As you are here, since you are here, what has come into existence because of you? What mark do you leave? Big questions, big questions. So Eve is presented as ruler, as Adam is. She's also presented as helper. This is huge. You see, Adam is given in 2.15, he's to work and to keep the garden. And then 2.18, God gives a helper suitable to him. This, this language of working and keeping is the same language describing the priests and their work in, in, in guarding the work of the temple. There's plenty we could say about that. There's a reality of protecting. That is, it is a na natural thing. When my wife was pregnant, she needed a different level of care in that time. If you've watched the movie Titanic, not all of it is historically true because it has men pushing women off light boats to get on themselves. But actually the writings of the reality of the, the sinking of the Titanic, men gave their, their, their seats up to women and kids. There was an instinct in their design that they need actually more protection. And, and, and I, don't, I don't know any home where, where there's a husband and a wife living there. If there's a weird noise out the back, Usually the husband, even if his wife would beat him in an arm wrestle, he, he's probably going to get up. There's an instinct. So there's a sense of something going on there 
This is not saying everything about men and women, but you, I think you can see there's a general thing there. But here's something else. She's described as a helper. Hear this. This is so important. The word helper is used usually for u- military reinforcements. <laughs> so the image is an army that's stuck, and now here comes reinforcements. God uses this term for himself. I'm your refuge. I'm your strength. I'm your help in time of trouble. I'm your helper. But he has the audacity to use it to describe Eve. She is military reinforcements. So, so the woman brings strength in the story. And strength, a particular type, that's suitable, that's fit for him. And the word that describes suitable is trying to interpret a Hebrew word that literally says like opposite. You think, well, make up your mind, like or opposite. No, that's the Hebrew word, literally like opposite. (laughs) How does that work? When you're thrown into an intense relationship with someone who is like opposite. Well, let me tell you, 27 years with someone who is like opposite me, you butt heads. You literally butt heads. If you have desire anything in in a marriage relationship like Adam, bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh, woo! Now I've seen what my life has all made. My life was all about this, right? (laughs) If desire increases, conflict has to increase. It's an absolute fact. If you have more desire, you have greater individuation, you're going to have conflict. The reality is, uh, hopefully, as I said this morning, uh, my wisdom portfolio has been permanently diversified. It means hopefully I'm wiser. I go through a bad thing and I've got at least a couple of seconds worth of Martin's wisdom that I might grab that I never had 27 years ago because we're butting heads. I, so here's the thing. You may be thinking, okay, I, that's actually very important to hear, but, but I'm not married. <laughs> and maybe I don't see myself getting married, maybe. So how are my deepest relational needs going to be met if I don't get married? Well, in a couple of weeks we're going to talk about that because Jesus and Paul were single. And Jesus tells you he's the ultimate spouse and brother. So we'll shelf that conversation. But the reality is you need someone who's different from you. You need people on the, on the other side of the gender gap, on the other side of, of the race gap, on the other side of of the temperament gap. You need people not like you to change you. So you can actually live the life you're intended to so you can become wise. You can be a better person. If everyone you're with is only ever like you, that's a limiting factor. So you need people different. That's a, a profound principle for life. Both Adam and Eve are presented as sinners, James is going to open that reality up more next week. They're tempted into rebellion and they hide and they blame. That's all of us. No one's wanting to take responsibility. But you will notice in there, this is just a hint. They They are both, Adam and Eve, treated as individuals. There's not this, maybe a fear of misogyny for the woman that she can't speak for herself. No, no, no. She speaks for herself. He speaks for herself. They're both invited to take responsibility for their actions but there's a lack of a willingness to take responsibility all the way through but in the end the new testament and the old testament here puts the blame right at the feet of adam and the serpent if you read the consequences of what happened she was genuinely deceived and so there's more responsibility to bear for them because of their actions and so in the end Uh, when the climax of the result that there'll be death uh, it says when Adam was removed from the garden so there's a sense of a representative role for all humanity and like Eve and us beneficiaries but he's he's representative she's beneficiary in in, in a sense here so they're presented as ruler as she's his helper he's his garter they're sinners But also, she's a life giver. She is the life giver. It's amazing that she's a life giver. I don't know if you ever thought about this, but the fall happened, here's two words, 
in Adam and through Eve. But God saves us in Christ through Mary. He reverses everything that happens at the fall. You don't get Jesus if you don't have Eve. Simple as that. There's a clear pattern of interdependence, beautiful difference between Eve and Adam in the story, helping us understand something about your design as in maleness and femaleness. You are beautifully different and essential to work together for God's purposes in the world. But notice God has reversed what the evil one did. The evil one, see, see, we had this first marriage that was intended to fill the earth with the children of God, but it failed because this man did not help his wife in a moment of need. And you think, okay, we just need a better man. Get a better man to show up and sort the issue. That's where the action is when God gets the men in. And so the big business is happening in king's courts and, and in men's circles. But if you read the Bible, that's not where the big action's happening. It's just not. It's so weird, the Bible. You'd think that's where the action would be, but God reverses everything. And so instead of women getting deceived, we have women deceiving tyrants all the way through the story. Sarah with Pharaoh and Abimelech, Rachel with Laban, Tamar with Judah, the Hebrew um, midwives with Pharaoh, Rahab with the men of Jericho, M Michael with Saul, Esther with Haman. Just, it, it's amazing the reversal. As God steps into history, he changes everything. And all the women who show up, Eve, Hagar, Leah, Miriam, Samson's mum, Ruth, Hannah, Esther, Deborah. Oh, there's too many. It's wonderful. They save cities. They save families, they save their kids, they're described as mum, as, as, as women, as, as, as daughters. This is where the actions are. At the beginning of the story of the kingdom in 1 Samuel, it's not at the place of power with Eli. It's Hannah struggling in her prayer, struggling with birth. This is where the action is as far as God's concerned. And so when Jesus comes, the one who is the ultimate life giver, who's tending to his body at his birth? Women. Who's tending to his body at his burial? Women. Who's tending to his body at the resurrection? Women. God has reversed everything. And when it comes to Jesus coming in our place the reality is we often feel like well i've got to do so much to prove my manliness or prove my female woman womanliness my work and the way i work and you know when everything fell apart we get thorns and thistles work will never work the way you want but on the cross jesus got the thorns jesus got the thorns and in the end he says it's finished the most important work ever done, paying for your sin and fulfilling the law of God. When Jesus came to free you from having to work to prove yourself, to earn God's love by your maleness or femaleness. And you needed someone to do what people have done in so many mass shootings around the globe. I watched some documentaries recently like the Port Arthur Massacre. And you often have stories in those tragic moments of men jumping overseas, being shot up, women under them, while injured, not dying. There are multiple accounts and multiple things. And by the way, I'm not trying to get us back to a 1950s uh, domesticated view of men and women. I'm not even going there. But this is truth all the time. You see it all the time in those accounts. And when Jesus, but you see, with Jesus, we're all the bride. He's our husband. And he's the one who jumped over to protect us. We're saved by someone else's blood. That's how it happens for us, all of us. Now, I hope some of the thoughts tonight get you started thinking about it from the way the Bible talks about maleness and femaleness. I promise you we're not going where you might think we're going. I promise you we're going to open up things in ways that we don't even know yet. Because <laughs> our hope is to let the Bible be our guide. So ask our music team to come up.
Uh, thank you for being patient tonight with a different sort of a talk. Uh, but it's just to let us begin thinking about this issue as we delve into it. I'm going to pray and then so you guys come up you can come up and get ready. Father God, thank you for your word and thank you for the, the way you made each of us. That somehow the, the way you made us is connected to our purpose in the world. Father, it's amazing the way you have changed history in unexpected ways. We ask you to help us pay attention to what you're really up to. In Jesus' name.